Hey everyone, so as usual, I have a baby in my lap, so you might have some wiggling, or you might see a little hand or a foot uh, flailing about. We'll see. She's sleeping right now. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that um, I am an intuitive healer and traditional midwife. My name is Anshan Kelly, and um, I had five natural births, and four of them were free births, which means there was no medical professional, or midwife at the births. You are watching traditional uh, free birth midwifery. <laughs> you are watching traditional midwifery too, but this um, particular series is called free birth midwifery. And I have been given the definite um, spiritual push and inspiration to talk to you about some really important things. And we're going to start with the uh, story, the children's story, or the folk tale, um, called Stone Soup. And um, most American children, most Western children, would have heard this story. Um, but if you're from a different culture, um, and I've, I'm from an international culture, international uh, community and culture, so, and probably every culture, there is a story similar to this one. I'm going to give an abbreviated version. However, uh, if you want to look it up, it's called uh, Stone Soup. Basically, the story begins with a couple of travelers that are um, they're coming from many, many towns away. And they're passing through um, a town that has been rather ravaged by some hard times and even you know the surrounding towns have also been or villages have been um, hit by some hard times and these travelers are going door door to door asking you know if anyone has you know a little um, bite of bread that they could they could share with them or um, a little cup of water that they could share with them or um, whether they could sit by the fire uh, for a little while to warm themselves up. And as it turns out, um, they basically get the door shut in their face, you know, and, um, for, you know, time and time again, and basically no one wants to invite them in, no one wants to offer them a morsel to eat. Um, some people really feel bad, but they feel... Um, they feel really tight and they really can't, they can't give anything. They have nothing they can give, um, to other people and they feel like they can barely sustain themselves at the moment. So the travelers having had very little success in the village, they decide to set up their own camp and they dig a little fire pit and they build a little fire and they're able to light the fire, um, and, and gather, you know, Make a, make a good, build a good fire. They have lots of good kindling and wood from the surround, wood from the surrounding woods. And they're able to get a bunch of water um, from the, the, the river that runs through the woods. But before they could actually, I was thinking about it, before they could actually get the water, they, they have to do something else because they, they don't really have anything. And, um, so they have to be able to ha get something to put the water in and, um, not only to, uh, gather it from the stream, but also to put it over the fire. So they actually end up, um, getting a really beautiful, smooth stone from the side of the river. And it's a beautiful white, smooth that's sto stone that's been smoothed by the riverbed. You know, from years and years and years, probably hundreds of years, you know, of the water uh, cascading over it. And people in the village are getting intrigued, you know. You know, they, they might, like, have slammed the door on these people's faces or turned them away feeling bad. But, you know, curiosity is a, is a, human, um, is a human weakness, for better and for worse. And they were looking out the window, and they saw that these... That these strangers had built themselves quite a quite a bonfire, and so some of them came over and you know, walked across 
the dirt road um, to the little encampment that the, 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 the strangers had, had set up, and they were saying, I'm sorry, I had a little, little wiggling there, and the baby and uh, heard some sounds out there. I got five kids, so you never know what's going on sometimes. Anyway, they anyway the, the these people started were curious, you know. They they want to also come and you know, get warm by this beautiful bonfire and just find out what's going on. And the 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 stranger said, um, uh, "We'd like to make what we call stone soup. See, we have this magical stone. They showed the villagers this beautiful white stone that they found." Um, um, near the riverbank, this is this this magical stone, you see, uh, has the ability to make a very nourishing soup. We carry it wherever we go, and if we just had a a cauldron, you know, a a pail to gather gather the water and a cauldron to put it in, and we put this the stone into the the cauldron with the water, we get it boiling up. We have the ability to make um, a really nourishing soup for the entire village. And the villagers were like, whoa, really? They, they hadn't heard anything like this, maybe ever. And, it's, and certainly their village had gone through some pretty hard times recently. So this was an inspired idea. They were kind of intrigued. And so one of them said, you know, I have a, I have a cauldron. And the other one said, uh, the other villager said, oh, I have a pail. And they went home and they... Um, both came back rather quickly with the cauldron and the pail, and the whole thing was set up uh, very quickly. And then they said, "Come on, come on, put the put the stone in there. Well, I want to see the magic." And so the the stranger said, "Okay," and they plopped the stone into the cauldron, and uh, they started to stir it with the with the big ladle that another villager had brought. And then the villagers were looking, and the the stranger said. I smell, I smell, it smells so good. It's hard though, it's working, it's working. But you know what it really needs? You know what it really needs? It really needs some carrots. You know, I think it would go really well. You know, this would go really well. And the crowd started gathering, you know, around the, around the cauldron. And, and they said, the villagers were like, oh, we got some carrots. A couple of the villagers were like, we got some carrots. I think I have, I can dig some up from the cellar. And so they, they ran, they ran off. And a few minutes later, you know, the, the villagers were watching, you know, and, and, uh, looking, looking for the, looking for the magic that was to happen in the cauldron. And the strangers were stirring the cauldron. And, um, they said, you know, you know, it's working, it's working. You know, I smell it. Don't you smell that? You know, but but you know what would really really help is that if we add some potatoes to this stew. You know, I think this that that would be really excellent. Um, that would really make the stone, um, the stone soup, all that much more nourishing and yummy. And so, the, some villagers ran off and said, you know, I could I I could probably dig up some potatoes out of my out of my garden. So they ran off and got some and. And after a few minutes, you know, the the strangers said that no, no, they won't, won't really, really go with this. You know, with the potatoes and the carrots and the and the magic stone soup, are some turnips, some turnips. And then pretty soon, you know, the strangers, the strangers were able to to get the whole village to run back and get just get something, get get something, get something, um, anything that they had. Maybe they had a carrot, maybe they had a potato, maybe they had a turnip. And they were even able to, someone was able to have a, you know, catch a chicken that was running around and, and slaughter that and defeather it and prepare it and make, make some, you know, put some, um, put the bones and the, and the nutritious, you know, meat and all to make it really, you know, make it that ancient, that ancient, um, nourishing food that is known as uh, bone broth and the strangers kept saying to the villagers you know that the the you know the chicken and the and the turnip and the potatoes and somebody had even had some had some beets left over somebody had some rice left over you know some grains of rice left over all these things would just would just go so well 
with the already nourishing soup that the that the magic stone is creating and after a while you know then the as the, as the strangers were stirring the, the stew and all the villagers were looking and now everyone was laughing and everyone was warmed up and people were bringing their bowls and their spoons ready to partake and and then the villagers said you know i mean the, the stranger said oh i think it's ready now and they were able to serve serve the soup to everybody so that is an abbreviated version of the magic stone soup the stone the stone in all folklore folklore has its roots in spirituality in religious practice in ancient religious practice and rites um, rites of passage spiritual rites that have been passed down for millions of years the stone, stones are often in stories a representative of the base, you know, the bones, the bones, um, which are, which denote and represent and point to the spirit. So the, you know, often uh, mountains are said to be, you know, mothers or protectors, um, um, nourishers in that way but they also can also have this ferocity to them and that they demand an enormous amount of humility um, and respect you know devotion to humility and respect and so that the stone the stone represents this I used to ponder this story so deeply when I was a little kid I'm like so how can you know how can these people say they have nothing then all of a sudden, just because just because there's a magic stone involved, all of a sudden they have something. They have nothing to share. They can't. Like, why didn't they just give them a carrot? You know, why can't they just give them a carrot when they're going by and when they when they when they uh, ask for it? Why does it take the strangers, you know, to build this fire and? And, and to carry this magic stone, you know, tell the, tell the villagers about this magic stone, you know, for them to go find a carrot, you know, to give them. I pondered this story so deeply, and I did, and I have my entire life, and, and so much of it has become so much more clear to me. And some, many people in modern Western culture would say, oh, it was a you know, it was a trick. It was a trick to help people do the right thing. And I guess that's an okay kind of way to interpret it. But really, the stone represents what lasts. It represents what doesn't move. You know, what might have ebb and flow, might be able to become part of something but over a long period of time be able to be carved by the water but a long periods of time this very slow um constant this deep spiritual principle of how things fundamental things change but and i was reading a, a holy scripture uh, recently um, holy book recently um, that's um, rooted in, in Eastern and Western um, spirituality and and it said um, that the way of you know the way of the will of selfless love of God of selfless love is a, a way that is a life that is made a path that is made in a thousand years so what you're doing now, what you're doing right now in the way of the Spirit, in the way of the will of God, which is the will of selfless love, you know, you, I know the G word, God, is, is this frightening, you know, rejected word in modern Western society, but call it what you want, okay? We're going to call it selfless love, okay? unconditional love sacrificial love you know the way of sacrificial love the, or the life of a sacrificial love life of sacrifice is a life that is made you know a path 
that is made in the, in the in a thousand years what you're doing right now on that path echoes a thousand years from now um modern western culture is a path that literally doesn't echo anywhere okay it doesn't echo anywhere it has no legacy modern western culture is not a stone it's not a mountain it's a culture that tries to force roses to bloom in greenhouses all year round the reality of the free birthing woman which is an ancient reality you know there are a lot there's a lot of evidence to show um um traditional and as well as anthropological um I, I couldn't think of the word record or um, documentation to show that free birthing or birthing a woman birthing on her own is is the most ancient form of birth of birthing of natural birth. Women all over the world still give birth, you know, especially in non Western cultures. You no, know, they they not not all obviously people have been influenced by uh, modern medicines, but. And certainly, and certainly, the village midwife is um, is also um, the ancient practice, you know, the ancient practitioner. But I mean, if you think about it, you know, back in the day, there weren't vehicles. You couldn't get miles and miles and miles, you know, between one place, you know, A and B, you know, points A and B, in a few hours or a day. You know, it would take a long time. And so women would be birthing on their own. Even if they did send for the midwife, that could be days. And so ancient people, ancient traditions are, have their roots in, in this cyclical understanding of self-sufficiency that isn't rooted in... I should say this, I should say it like this, that can't be rooted in right here, right now, what I want right here, right now, that mentality isn't rooted in anything. It doesn't have roots. Self-sufficiency, real self-sufficiency, not something else masquerading as that, but real self-sufficiency, especially true self-sufficient women are rooted in the stone soup, in the magic stone. Is it quote unquote abracadabra magic stone? No, that's that's a very sort of watered down, you know, modern um, modern take. But it's magic in the sense where this is an inspired thought. This is an inspired. Um, way of doing things and activating, activating the spirit. You know, the villagers can represent a society, a nation, a family, an individual, okay, who has just gone many, too many years in soul famine. You know, when I say soul famine, um, soul starvation is when, for whatever reason, whatever the circumstances are that cause this, is that they're there isn't sufficient um, cyclical coming and going um, of life force that also allows death, that allows rebirth. There's an insistence somehow, somewhere, some way, you know, um, often smaller, you know, s smaller place uh, communities or just or ind individuals are often. Um, uh, left left bereft of of what they need to live because of un, um many many decisions that were made um outside of them outside of them but but connected to them and so you know maybe the the river got dammed up or you know po the river was poisoned way up river away from the individual or this or the society but Eventually, that river flows into the smaller groups, the smaller um, entities that then experience this poisoning or drying or famine. 
I'm just going to give a very simple but powerful example of this poisoning, this damning, you know, that, sorry, I have a little wiggly baby here, is this narration that was created by the early, you know, obstetric practices, which were actually um, rooted in, sorry, I got a, I'm trying to get a, bit, a better position here. No, the fairly, um, in the grand spectrum of things, a fairly new uh, medical practice of childbirth. Um, and a lot of the obstetric pra practices are rooted in the uh, pushing out and blocking of, of midwives and women who are at the center of a community that are, that are providing that deep foundational stone mountain womanly care for everyone and and, and especially um in the last few hundred years um the um the black um slave women who had become midwives were known as nanny midwives and then later on um became free and they were um quite relied upon and trusted and even, you know, to a certain extent, respected by plantation owners. But when obstetric practice began to rise, the male, the male only, um, obstetric practice began to rise up. Um, and then also, um, it, sh it shouldn't be forgotten, that also the indigenous American uh, midwives as well, who, and the black midwives, who helped to basically birth, um, deliver, most of early America, obviously on um, post-colonization, um, the male-only, wh white male-only obstetric practice um, obviously wanted to push them out and insert their own, um, their own practices, which are mostly centered around how to make plantation owners more money. And so this narration, you know, this broken record that just goes on in the background, sometimes in the deep subconscious background, and but nonetheless, you know, none the, nonetheless at the headwaters, you know, the um, this narration, this toxic narration, this lie that gets narrated in at in the at the headwaters where the nanny midwives and the indigenous midwives and um, other um, um, European midwives were supposed to was supposed to be to help um to s sustain actually sustain and move um humanity forward and through whatever the um struggles and mistakes and and growth that was going on at the time instead you know got replaced um through a, a forcing and a and a and um emotional as well as uh, verbal and as well as um, um, I'm sorry I had a little interruption there so I um, I need to get back on track um, and it seems like I have a little bit of laundry back there anyway the 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 stone women you know the root women at the headwaters of society got gutted and forced out and um, threatened you know threatened um, taken over and the way that, that that happened is through narrations such as broken records, toxic, haunting broken records, deep in the subconscious and trauma and a traumatized subconscious of, of womankind, is that childbirth is inherently dangerous. It's actually and, and there's actually nothing, almost nothing to suggest in in um, ancient culture that childbirth was at all dangerous. The only in and of itself, the only times that childbirth in ancient times, you know, uh, th which is most of most of um, human history, was dangerous is when there was some kind of conflict going on. There was a conflict going on, or some famine, natural, natural or um, industrial famine going on, some kind of stress or trauma that is being inflicted upon the individual or the society. Otherwise, childbirth is never um, described, you know, in hundreds, even thousands of, of documented, you know, sources. 
where we can gather through different um, different unearthings of artifacts or traditions, you know, gathered from word of mouth of still um, traditions, no, traditional cultures are still around that have sustained even through so much. There's nothing to suggest that childbirth is inherently dangerous in and of itself. Um, the other thing is that childbirth has is definitely, definitely made much more dangerous with the insertion of medical practice. In fact, the other day I was just reading an article about how a village midwife who had been who had been helping to deliver the babies in her culture for generations um suddenly was being told by the Mexican government that um that you know basically what she was doing was dangerous and that they were required to transport these women who were birthing to ho- to a hospital and but this woman and her and her peers you know her her traditional midwife peers and the women going back generations have been able to deliver these babies um safely in their culture and through the ancient knowledge that pulsates through their their um communal and spiritual and traditional root systems but the um the transport to the hospital proved to be extremely traumatic um just because you know the woman had to well the woman had to first of all get into a a car and then she had to um drive quite a ways out of the village to a, to the nearest hospital and then there was a lot of waiting involved and a lot of trauma a lot of stress and you know because of all the waiting and a lot you know, when the body gets when the mother's body is stressed and she's undergoing a lot of um demands on her body during labor i mean this should be this should be an obvious fact when you know, she has to do those extra not just those extra steps but it's not, that now she has to pull herself out of her familiar and protective surroundings and go to somewhere un, not only unfamiliar but a place that is not necessarily having her best interests at heart because she doesn't have a relationship with them you know she's a village woman who you know the nearest hospital is is quite quite far away um often there is um a traditional gap at that point because of the modernization of um locations of peoples and locations um where medicalized practices have taken root and the body will often stall i, I grew up on a farm and i saw this um i would say often enough um to to gather knowledge about it where the the you know un, uh, when there is stress involved and there is trauma involved the the mothers and i certainly see it now in 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 women um going through extended gestations that their 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 the body will stall you know the body will delay the um you know delay the pregnancy and depending on how much stress and how much trauma that there is and this woman it was um at term and not only that she was in active labor and so when she when her body has to go through this stalling in active labor then there's a lot, there's a lot of risk to the baby that stalling happens because she is releasing an enormous amount of adrenaline and cortisol and that's now pulsating through her system that's putting her into fight or flight mode this is not the position that she should be in you know during labor and anyway um in this case she gave birth to a stillborn um i you know i wasn't there i don't know the full circumstances surrounding the situation but it basically the article was expressing how how much stress and how much um the severed identity from traditional practices and the and not only that um worst of all the diminutizing at the very least and abuse abusive language uh that is used to diminutize and to create terror and fear surrounding the stone women the root women the traditional midwives the women at the center of communities and traditions for generations and 
know, many times if you follow the line of that tradition and that culture going back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and even since time out of mind. The insertion, the narration that childbirth is inherently dangerous was a very lethal one, and it has poisoned the waters of, um, the headwaters of womanly consciousness in uh, the modern world, the modernized world, and the Western world for generations, for hundreds of years. The free birthing woman, the free birthing woman is the stone, is the magic stone. She is the magic mountain. She is that new spark, that inspired thought that helps to awaken that numbed um, consciousness headwaters of consciousness that have been poisoned and numbed and gone into a dormancy that just has this broken record going over and over and over again in the background. I mean, it just had someone repeat the same words, the same words regarding the dangers of, of childbirth inherently without a hospital, without medicalized practices, when at this point... Okay, I will put the video, my first video about free birth in which I, um, I list a lot of different sources, a ton of sources that cite um, other hundreds of sources um, and also hands-on practice just in the last you know, 40, 60 years about the overwhelming evidence that doesn't suggest, that proves at this point, okay, that proves that childbirth is not inherently dangerous and that medical practice has had some of the, some of the most mainstay um, influences and hands in actually introducing danger into childbirth. The reason why the villagers, I figured out as an adult and it grows that that um that inspired thought that comes straight from selfless love that comes straight from the source you know from the source from the heart of all things the reason why the villagers didn't have a carrot didn't have a carrot to give to these strangers who knocked on their door on their door and didn't have um some some water or bread or anything to give to these villagers who are passing through the reason why they didn't have it when the villagers came to them one by one, but they suddenly had it when they were introduced to the magic stone and to this magnificent idea that had, has spirit at the center of it, had, that is at the center of each human being that gathered the human beings around the source of life itself, you know, that's represented in the cauldron. This, that is an ancient, the cauldron is an ancient um, symbol of the womb. In ancient practice, it is said all over the world in all different ways that the self-sustaining woman who gives birth, you know, on her haunches by herself and catches her own baby holds up the world. She is the goddess. She is the foundation that only not only gives life, to all things, but she holds up the source and structure of all things. We don't have the energy or the time to look for a little bread or a carrot or build, you know, share our fire, our fireplace or hearth with somebody else. We don't have the time or energy for that when we have been numbed by the narrations at the headwaters um, at, the, at the headwaters that are being poisoned by powers that are simply put there to, um, to profit and to insert a certain type of control over the way life actually works and instead try to lay over it some other kind of lifestyle that is um, you know, only perceiving what is happening physically right now instead of what is the path, what is the path, what is the journey that is made in a thousand years.